Good morning. I want to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 50. And while you're turning there, I'm going to give a brief update of the work out at uh, Mexican Water Baptist Church. What's been going on out there? It's good to see Michelle and Arena here from Mexican Water Baptist Church. And we're glad that they're here. What special people they are. And uh, we invited everybody to come this morning. And uh, some are back there preaching and teaching for us. I think that uh, actually Michelle's father is uh, filling in for Sunday school. And I think Brother Kevin's going to do the services. And so uh, it's good to know that we've got men there that can stand up and preach and teach. And uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you who I am because some of you don't know. Uh, my name is Andy Loman, a missionary to the Navajo Indians. And me and my family, there's some of these prayer cards out there on the back uh, a welcome desk. Feel free to grab one of those and take that with you. But Danielle, would you stand up? Some people don't know you. And, and Emma, if you would too. Emma did her hair today so she can stand up. <laughs> and, um, and then there's Austin back here. And this is my wife, Danielle. And then I've got a daughter down in Florida named Mariah. We'll be talking a little bit about that in just a few minutes. And then Trenton, he's down in Texas at Texas Independent uh, Baptist Seminary. He's in his last year of school, and uh, he found a little redheaded girl that he really likes down there, and they're thinking about getting married, and so that's pretty scary. And, um, and, and then there's Austin up here. Many of you know Austin. Just let you ladies know he's single, and uh, he's a girlfriend, and he just hit the floor. I don't know what's going on. And uh, then there's Emma over here. And uh, Emma, she will never be single. She's going to stay at home her whole life. And so, but we're, we're proud of her. And then there's Drew and Gunnison. If you, if you listen real close, you could probably hear them in the back making some kind of racket, tearing something up. And, uh, but that's my family. And you know, out of everything the Lord has put underneath uh, Danielle and myself, my kids are probably my most proudest thing that God has done in our life. And, uh, you know, I just... I look at my kids and I just thank God uh, that every one of them is serving the Lord in some facet in a way or shape or form. And, you know, and I, I think that's that's the goal of every uh, parent is that their kids will grow up serving the Lord. And so, um, you know, uh, pastoring down at Mexican Water, being a youth minister in, in, in my younger years and all those things that I've done. My kids are, are what I'm most proud of. And then um, also, uh, honorable mention, my mother-in-law is here this morning. And so we're, we're, uh, we're thankful that she is with us. And I speak of you often and, uh, in good ways, in good ways. And, uh, but, uh, you know, she gave me a wonderful wife. And so I, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Her and her husband serve faithfully uh, back in uh, by the Lake of the Ozarks. And so uh, we're glad that they're here this morning. Also, the young lady you've seen up here uh, singing, Miss Abby, she works with us on a continual basis at Mexican Water Baptist Church. She's a teacher down there, and so we really appreciate her and her sacrifice going down and, and serving with us. Mexican Water Baptist Church, what's been going on there is that uh, we've kind of been in flux. We're not, I wouldn't say we're back to pre-COVID state, but uh, we've been uh, trying to have church every Sunday, and then sometimes Navajo Nation says no, and uh, we do it anyhow, so don't tell anybody. And um, uh, then, then uh, the rain comes and washes out. Uh, our road, many of you have been there and, and have seen the road, but it's about two and a half miles off the paved road. And so if you were to leave here, uh, if you were to leave here and you were to go to Mexican Water Baptist Church, uh, you would go down here to the four corners and then you go to Tisnas Pass and then you go all the way across 160 to Mexican Water. And then there you would get off the main road and you go down, down that main road there. And then you go down in the wash and you go across the wash. And then on the other side, there's a little Hogan Church there. And that's where we're at. And so the rain plagues us and our road's about gone. Uh, the, the county and the Navajo Nation fight over who's going to take care of that road. And so, uh, so right now we're driving around the, the bridge uh, going down through the wash, and so uh, it's just been a, a thing. But we've been running, I would say, between 20 and 25 every Sunday, and uh, we've kind of started back our uh, every uh, Sunday lunch, and it's been really good. The spirit's been good. Uh, the people have been super faithful to the Lord, 
And it's been such a blessing. We had one young lady saved since uh, we've gotten back from the COVID break. And uh, we're just excited about what God's going to do in the future. And we're seeing some maturity in some of our men and taking that leadership role. And that's exciting. You know, that's exact. You know, that's whatever the goal of a pastor should be is to reproduce himself inside the church so that if something were happening with the pastor, the church could go on without a beat. Amen. Amen. And nobody be looking around saying, what are we going to do? They just know what they're going to do. Amen. Amen. They're going to keep the main thing, the main thing, and they're going to win souls. They're going to baptize and teach to observe all things whatsoever. Right. Yeah. And so that's what a, a, the goal of the pastor is. And so that's uh, super, uh, super exciting. And so we're, we're looking forward to the future. We never know what God's got planned, right? Amen? Yeah. Now, don't have a clue. Don't know, what, don't know what's going to happen next week. We just got to go with whatever God says. Amen? Right. I'm excited about, I hear that, uh, Ken and Heather, you're going to be speaking tonight? That's, that's awesome. Isn't that awesome? Now, now Brother Burkett said that they're going to be talking on his, his roles and her roles. I do have a question about that, if you can help me with that. Is Ken going to be preaching on what she should be doing? And she should be preaching on what he should be doing? Is that the way? All right. All right. I'm going to be here then. That's going to be exciting. Amen. And uh, that, that is exciting. Well, I want to invite you to open your Bibles uh, to the book of Genesis. And if you have any questions, I would, I would uh, urge you to get, get a hold of us, either through telephone or I might return your call. I might not. I'm not sure. Um, or catch us after service. I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about Mexican Water Baptist Church and what's going on down there. It's pretty exciting. <clears throat> I get thirsty, so I brought my own drink this time. I got Mountain Ops Ignite in here. That's pretty awesome, right? <laughs> Is little Vince in here? Is little Vince in here somewhere? He's not in here. He was texting Austin last night. And Austin shared with him that I was going to preach today. And little Vince texts, well, at least it'll be a short sermon. <laughs> I don't know what that means. but uh, So here's the deal. If it's a long service, you go see little Vince, all right? And you say, it's your fault, mister, that this was a long service. All right. Genesis chapter 50. About a year ago in October... Uh, Brother Burkett and I got to go up to um, Wyoming and go antelope hunting. And we began to just talk uh, about some things that God was uh, dealing with us. And uh, this particular scripture came up in our uh, conversation. And I began to share with Brother Burkett my but God experience in my life. And, um, you know, and, and, you know he, he, and he already had thought and been praying about that being your theme for this year. And that's been your theme at uh, Lighthouse Baptist Church this past year or this year. And uh, the, but God, you know, and what God has done in our life. And, uh, and then a few weeks ago, he asked me to uh, think about coming to preach about my but God story. I, I got to tell you this morning that it's uh, uh, this is not going to be easy for me. I've always preached, and I've always taught, and I've left myself out of it, and I've only tried to preach what God says, and I've tried to leave what Andy Loman is out of it, because I'm thankful that God can use me Amen. as the sinner that I am, Amen. and my story, but I began to pray about it, and I really think that God wants me to tell that story this morning, because I think there might be a man or a woman in here struggling with their story that they're living right now. I don't know. And I don't know your personal life. And I don't know what you're going through. But I know that uh, God does. And God doesn't want you to give up. So this morning we're going to be looking at some things. And they're pretty sensitive in the world that we live in today. And uh, I'll be sharing those with you. And I'm excited. We may be here 30 minutes. We may be here an hour and 30 minutes. I, uh, this is a Navajo watch. And... Um, <laughs> Right, Michelle? Right? And, and, and it, it's not even working. So uh, uh, Genesis chapter 50, verse 17. Follow along with me there. Let's, let's start at verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us. 
and will cer certainly requite us of all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent messengers unto Joseph, Joseph saying, uh, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sons, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive uh, the trespasses of the servants of the uh, of uh, excuse me servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brothers, all, or brethren, also went and fell down before his face. And they said unto him, uh, uh, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought it evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and your many blessings upon our life. And Lord, we just ask that you might take these scriptures this morning. And Lord, that you might uh, use them. And Lord, in a mighty way. And Lord, we just ask that you might strengthen someone here this morning that might be in the midst of a but God experience or Lord, that might go through one. And Lord, we just ask that you might use us in, a, in uh, the only way that you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother, you got any napkins, tissues up here somewhere? I'll just borrow your shirt, too. There you go. Thank you. All right. Um, Genesis chapter 50 there. There are some things that we want to look at. Uh, and there's three things that I want to tell you before we begin. That might be in your mind this morning, and uh, this was in my mind several years ago, and uh, you know, b before uh, when I was going through this God, uh, this but God experience in my life. But the first thing I want you to know is God's not done with you yet. Amen. And I know that's not super profound, but I think it's somebody needs to hear that this morning. God is not done with you yet. There's so many people that are sitting on their bed and they're depressed and they're saying, I'm useless. God's done with me. But let me tell you, he's not. Right. Number two, uh, God can take evil and turn it into good. Right. Yeah. It is amazing to me. God is an expert at taking broken things and putting them back together for his honor and glory. Yeah. Right. It is just amazing how he's done that. And we'll, we'll share some of that this morning. Uh, number three. To learn to remain faithful through evil times. Stick with the stuff. Keep going. There may be somebody in here this morning that's right on the cusp of quitting. And saying, I'm not going to church no more. It's not working out like I thought. There may be somebody in here that's on the cusp of maybe talking about divorce to the, their other person, right? Maybe there's other things. They're, they're just right there. But I want to encourage you to remain faithful through evil times. I wanted to say those three things because I've lived those. I've lived those things right there that, that are really hard. And, and they're really hard to understand. And they're really hard. Not now. Not when things are calm. But when things are evil. Amen. That's when it's hard to really grasp onto things. And there's a few things that I want to look at. In the uh, Three things here. And the first thing is the operation. The operation of Joseph in the but God text that we see before us. How did he, how did he operate? I can't, I can't stay up here. i got to get down here. Now, Lily and Adam, I'm sorry. Did you bring a towel? <laughs> Those of you that know me that get a little excited and, you know, we just, we just go, right? And so uh, um, the operation of Joseph. It's, it's amazing to me when you see Christians go through this, this evil time. We already established that he was going through an evil time or had been. And you look at Joseph in his life. And could you imagine being Joseph? Could you, could you imagine going through what he went through? You guys have heard. Has everybody heard the story of Joseph? Know what I'm talking about? That he, went, he was down in Egypt and he was the well-favored of 12 sons. And he went down to see how his brethren were. And he had a coat of many colors, a really nice coat. And his brothers hated him and despised him. Man, could you imagine being that guy? 
Can you imagine uh, this evil that they thought of him and, and, and this operation that he had? The very, third, uh, the very first thing there we see that he, he reduced himself. Notice in verse 17. It says there, uh, the very last part, And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And all this evil that had befallen him by his brothers and his brothers threw him in the pit. And they conspired against him to kill him. And then he was sold into slavery. And then down into Egypt and things were looking up and Potiphar's wife lied about him and then he got thrown in prison and forgotten about and all of these things that went through and transpired in Joseph's life and here he is before his brother, his dad who's the authority in his life has, has passed on his brothers are standing before him and he had the power within himself to just knock them off and to wipe them out and to reap uh, revenge against them but he decided to reduce himself and humble himself before them that's not in my nature. Amen? How many of you are going to be honest this morning and say that's not in my nature? Amen? That, we don't, that's not how we want to operate. We want to just fight back. And we want to say, you know what you give to me? I'm going to give it back to you, right? I mean, we're Republicans, right? I'm just, sorry. I shouldn't have went there. That's funny, though. Over in the book of James... Notice what it says there, if you'll turn with me. James chapter 4. Right after Hebrews, you'll find the book of James. Chapter 4. Notice what it says in verse 6. But he giveth grace, or he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. As Joseph was there and he was following God's leadership in this, this experience of that these brethren of his uh, thought it evil towards him, he decided to humble himself in this time. I tell you what, when you're going through a but God experience, you need to learn how to humble yourself. The word humble is uh, literally to make oneself low. I've thought about that many times. And how do you make oneself low? I don't have much trouble. I'm pretty short. And, um, but how do you, how, you know, the, the, to, God gives grace to those that make themselves humble. Th that you put yourself in a humbling position. Joseph wept before his brethren. He was the second in Egypt, by the way. And he decided to bow himself down and cry before his brethren. I mean, how much more humble could you get? Amen. He didn't have to. He chose to. He reduced himself. First Peter 5, 6 says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Amen. Amen. Hey, I think, you know, when we're going through these but God moments, I think we really need to learn how to humble ourselves. Not only before God, but for maybe the people that did the evil. It's so hard. But I tell you what, that's part of being a Christian. Not only did he reduce himself, but he re reassured his brethren. Notice what it says there in verse 19. It says, and Joseph said unto them, fear not. He says, it's all right, guys. D don't worry. Fear not. Not only did he say, fear not, but he said, for am I in the place of God? That's great to understand that he reassure others that you're not in the place of judgment, right? You know, that, that's really hard, right? Because we know what should happen to the people that do us wrong, right? We've even told ourselves that, right? Boy, it's a good thing that we don't have lightning in our control, isn't it? I tell you, I'm going... <laughs> Going down I-40 back home, there'd be a lot of holes in the top of vehicles. <laughs> Amen? All this is be honest, right? Huh? Some of you are sitting back there. I mean, you, you just look like you sucked on a prune or something. I don't know. <laughs> but we're real. This is the real thing, right? This is the real thing. And we need to learn not only how to reduce, but we need to reassure those around us. Say, hey, I'm not in the place of God. And it, it, it says there in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 5, 
Uh, it says there, it says, uh, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who uh, both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsel of the hearts. And he and then shall every man have praise. It's going to be God's responsibility to judge us. Amen. Right, yeah. And we, we've got to learn that as people. When we're going through these God moments, we, not, we need to, to, to reduce, but we need to reassure others. We need to reassure others that even though you've done evil to me, it's not my place to judge you, right? It's not my place to bring condemnation on you. It's not my place to say, thus saith the Lord. It is God's going to judge you, amen? And we need, to not, we need to reassure others, but not only that we need to reduce and we need to reassure, but we need to release. This may be the hardest of the three. Verse 21, he talks to him about his kids. He says, you know what? I'm going to take care of you guys. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to go on with life. I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to take care of your children, and I'm going to, I'm going to do what's right. Amen? Amen? You know, when you forgive others, you release yourself right. and you release them from prison. That's right. This is hard. This is one of the hardest things that I think I've ever had to do is forgive Danielle. I mean, I mean other people, right? <laughs> to forgive other people is hard. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand this morning, but in your heart, I want you to raise your hand. How many people are sitting in this church this morning, and you could raise your hand and say, I've got some unforgiveness in my heart towards someone. Someone. That someone may be gone. But you're still holding on to that unforgiveness. Maybe that someone is sitting right next to you. Don't point them out. <laughs> Maybe that someone's at your house right now. Maybe they're across the country. Maybe you don't even know their telephone number. You know nothing about them anymore. But you still got some unforgiveness in your heart. Hey, these God moments that we go through, it's time to do some releasing. Yes. It's time to let it go. It's time to make a phone call. It's time to turn to that person next to you and say, you know what? I know that you're in the middle of this evil and I know that you did these things. But I want to let you know that I'm standing before you and I'm forgiving you for what you have done to me. Amen. Will you forgive me for what I did to you? Because I need some release in this moment. I need some release in this thing. Huh? So reduce. Reduce yourself. And then reassure others. And then release them. Let them go. Luke 6, 27. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Do good. Just let them go. Release them of that. And you'll do yourself a favor. So not only the operation that Joseph did in this but God text, but notice the origin of the evil in this uh, but God text. Notice there in, uh, on, the, on the surface, you see here, uh, he says, uh, verse 20, but as for you, right? He says, but as for you, ye thought it evil against me. Joseph is now addressing those brothers that thought evil against him. Man, there's some origins of this evil. And we need to really look at those things and understand those things. And it says on the surface of his brothers, you see the you. And, and you know, his brothers were jealous of him. If we were to go back in, in chapter 37 in verse 18 and 19, we see they conspired to kill him. And then, then they said uh, in verse, uh, uh, verse 11, they envied against him. Verse 20, they decided to kill him. In verse 27, then they decided to sell him. And then they were, he was lied about. And so the, the, those origins of this evil came from their brothers. And you know what? Sometimes the greatest evils that come across our plate are from those that love us. And those that care about us. Inside of our family, maybe inside of a, a co-worker. And heaven forbid, sometimes 
The evil comes from inside the church. Joseph was dealing with this and those, the origins of the evil was inside of his family. I can't even begin to imagine to visit with my brethren and have them say, you know, as they were gathered together outside and they were, he was going down to see him. Can you imagine when he was walking down the hill to them, had his coat of many colors on, you know, he was having a great day. And there's his brother sitting down around the campfire. And they said, here comes the dreamer. Here he comes. And one of them turns to the other one and says, guess what, guys? Now's our chance. Let's kill him. Let's kill him. Tell dad a wild beast ate him. And can you imagine after he got down there and the, and the one guy yelled to the other guy, grab him. And they grabbed him and they tied him up. And as Joseph was sitting there listening to his siblings talk about murdering him. Now some years later, he's sitting with them in front of him. My goodness, what a story. But can you imagine the heartbreak inside of Joseph? And then they threw him in the pit. And they put him down in the pit. And as he's looking up out of the pit. And hearing their conversation saying, ha ha, we finally got him. Let this dreamer get out of this one. Then Reuben says, hey, let's not kill him, let's sell him. Let's make a profit off of him. You imagine the conversation about that? Anyone here ever been sold? Don't answer. <laughs> Amen? But it's true. Joseph got sold. What does that do to a person's psyche? Not only to be planned a murder in front of but to be sold. And then can you imagine Joseph on that train with uh, those, um, who were they? Someone tell me. I can't remember. Who, who did they sell them to? Ishmaelites? Is it, was it them? Anyhow. Those people and sent them down to, can you imagine being on that train, bound, tied up? Nobody speaks your language. Been there before, y'all. Huh? Nobody speaks your language. You have no clue what anybody said. And then they take and they set you up and on an auction block. And they say, the origins of the evil came from his brothers. I imagine bitterness could have been easily uh, into his life. And, and he could have gotten bitter over this origins. But you know what? It really didn't originate with just his brothers. But it originated with Satan himself. Notice what it says. In the Bible, in John 8, 44. Open your Bibles there. You tell little Vince he was wrong. <laughs> We're going to preach this morning, amen. John 8, 44. Ye are the father, ye are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father um, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he bowed not in truth. Because there is no truth in him, what he speaks is a lie. He speaks of his own, for he is a liar, and he's the father of it. See, the origins really of the evil that come into our life are sometimes not our family. Sometimes they're being used by the devil to plant that evil inside of our life. Yeah. It comes into our life. And see, if, if, if there's a lie... It started with the devil. If there's a myth truth, it started with the devil. That means to tell me the devil's all over Washington, D.C. And that's the truth. No matter what side of the aisle you're on. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let me tell you, there's, the, there's demons and devils in the upper atmosphere that we don't know nothing of. And there's powers that are uh, controlling this evil. And there's a whole mess of evil in this world. Amen. And Joseph was looking at his brothers with love in his heart, dealing with them, knowing that the origins didn't originate from his brethren, but they really originate from the devil. It's good, it's good. You know that sometimes, and I hate to say this, 
we can be used as a conduit of evil towards other people. I have to stop myself because every one of us begin to begin to tell ourselves stories in our mind, right? Well, I do. Somebody will agree with me somewhere in here. Somebody does something to us and we begin to tell stories. Well, this is why they did this. You don't know that. Amen? I have to talk to myself like that. I have to say, now, Andy, you don't know that's why they did that. Amen? Because we don't know. You know what the, the, the Christian thing for you to do? Go talk to them. Go talk to them and say, hey, you know what? My mind's telling me this story of how you're so mean or whatever. But why'd you really do that? Huh? And you know what? They'll look at you like a deer in a headlight. It's like, uh, and the funny thing is sometimes you'll, you know, you'll find out that they didn't mean it the way you thought at all. Right, right. Amen? Yep. But you know what? The devil's the one who starts implanting those. Yeah. You know, the devil's desire for us is to destroy us. In Romans, or 1 Peter 5, 8, you know, he's as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Right. You know, the devil's desire for you after you get saved is to destroy you. To absolutely destroy your family. To absolutely destroy your witness. To get you off the sidelines and not do anything. Could you imagine if Joseph would have allowed the tricks of the devil to have influence in his life? Of the great things he would have missed in his life. Of the great promises and the great blessings that flowed from Joseph, he himself. It would have been a disaster. Millions of Israelites were down there that got saved alive because of Joseph. What blessing are you missing? Are you allowing the devil to get you sidetracked on what God has for you? Even though the devil counted as evil, God took those same circumstances and turned them around. But God meant it for good. Oh my goodness. No, hold on now. We gotta we gotta we gotta state this again. These are the exact same circumstances that Joseph went through. The evil, the bad. The, the, the being sold, the conspiracy, the, the hatred, the jealousy, the lying, the being sold, all this evil. God took those same circumstances and used them for good. <laughs> that ought to blow your mind. Quit pouting about what's going on in your life. Amen? You ever met the Christian? You know what I'm talking about, right? And I'm not making fun of you. I'm just saying the reality is that God can take that and turn that around and use it. to. You know what's stopping God? It's this. Is what's stopping God from being able to use that evil in your life to make it good. Can I get an amen there? Amen. I've been in churches where people got up and ran around the room screaming and yelling and just praising God. It's okay. You're not going to embarrass me. Amen. You may embarrass your pastor, but you're not going to embarrass me. Okay. I am okay with that. A little Baptist will never hurt anybody. Amen. It, it, it's okay. All right. D did you guys hear about the kidnapping at the high school this week? It's pretty bad. Don't worry. He woke up. That was good there. So, yeah, you, you guys that are booing me, you're going to be telling that tomorrow in the office. You know you will. That's funny. I don't care who you are. You know what my theme for uh, Mexican Water Baptist Church next year is? I'm thinking about get her done. <laughs> Doesn't that sound? I know someone else said that before, but I think it'll work, right? There's a lot we need to do. But now let's look at the outcome. Let's look at the outcome 
of the but God text. It says there in uh, Genesis chapter 50. Notice the last part of that verse there. Is in verse 20. It says there, But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. I mean, all that evil and all those bad things that people have, have gone through. You know, God may have meant it for good in your life. God may, may be taking those same situations, even though it was originated from the devil, He may be taking those same situations in your life and turning those around to be a gem inside of your life. I, I read on how um, diamonds are made. And man, it takes, I forget how much pressure, I don't know why I read it, but anyhow. But uh, there's some details there that it takes so much pressure and like 2,000 degrees heat or something like that. To push that coal together to make a diamond. And you know what? Sometimes God does that with us. Right. He puts us in situations and brings something marvelous out of it. Right. It's just incredible. And now I want to kind of get to where I had alluded earlier. That I wanted to tell you about my but God experience. And I know there's going to be naysayers. And there's going to be some that will throw a condemning eye towards me. But you know what? They're not in the place of God. I don't have to stand in the judgment seat of, or in the judgment throne and have them sitting on the judgment throne looking down at me and judging me. I can only tell you what I've experienced and what God has done in my life. Back when I was 21... A long time ago, 25 years ago, I think. 25, that's a long time. 25 years ago, I think in 1996, Bill Clinton was president. Mm -hmm. Keep your opinions to yourself. <laughs> Hillary was on the stand, giving account for Whitewater. There's all kinds of stuff going on that year. But anyhow, God worked in a little church called Reedville Baptist Church. And I had begun to start to come back to church. I, had, I was raised in church. And my parents were God-fearing uh, Christians. They had me in church every Sunday. And, uh, you know, it didn't matter what was going on. Uh, you know, I had a real bad drug problem as a kid. My dad would drag me back behind the woodshed. He would drag me to church. And he just, all kinds of dragging going on. And... Um, but uh, Doug Briggs was the pastor at that time. God began to work on my heart, soften my heart. I began to come to church. And he began to work in my heart. And uh, I was working um, commercial electric at CEC Electric. And uh, I was there. And uh, it just so happens they were going to camp like in the next week. And I was at work that week. And I had been going back to church. And I knew they was going to camp. And they needed <clears throat> counselors. And I'm like, I'm not going, I'm not going to camp. I'm too old to go to camp. And it was at Triple S Ranch in uh, Arkansas. And I went back, I went in on Friday at work and got my paycheck Friday, Friday evening. Um, Dick Bird, I was the boss. He come out and he said, I need some volunteers to be laid off next week. We're just out of work. I'm like, that's me. You know, 21, you're like, I'll volunteer to be laid off, right? But, you know, I got to putting the pieces together, and it wasn't a coincidence. It was God moving. And so, you know what, I, I said, you know what, I'll go to camp, but I'm not riding no bus all the way to Arkansas. I said, I'll drive my tr own truck down there. So I did. I, dr I followed him down there. And God began to work that week at camp. I don't know how many of you have been to Triple S Ranch, but it's an amazing uh, camp. And I think it's the bishops down there. Uh, Brother John Bishop, I think, is running it now. And uh, was down there, and God began to speak through this, uh, the messages and the preaching. And I knew at that time that God was calling me to preach. Amen. And I said, you know what, Lord? I don't know why me, but I, you called me. I'm going to go. Amen. And so... That was in July and August. I had signed up for uh, Florida Baptist Schools in Brandon, Florida. Loaded up my pickup truck and drove to, drove to Florida. 
I was down there in school, uh, finished my first year and finished uh, into my second year. And I met a young lady down there. Her dad was a missionary in Montana, Whitefish, Montana. And uh, uh, spent some time and I got engaged. I got married. So, yeah, to answer your question, yes, I've been married before. Got married, had a child about five years into it. And you know what? The devil got into that thing, into that marriage. She ended up leaving after the baby was just about three months old. I was at camp, had 40 kids there at camp. I came home from camp, and I knew something was amiss. And I went home to Balm, Florida there, and I opened that door of that single wide trailer, and there was nothing in there. And that single one, my baby was gone, my wife was gone. While I was gone, her parents come and picked her up, had a restraining order laying on the floor there. And I was not to go there, not to be around them, and not of nothing. I laid on that floor for three days. I said, God, how could this be? I'm serving you in school. I'm going to school. I'm a youth pastor. I said, God, why, why would you allow this in my life? And I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. I question God. And if you're more holy than that, more power to you. I said, God, why? Long story going through that and through the things and then you walk into church when you finally recover yourself and you're, you go into church and everybody's looking at you like what did you do? And what, what, why did you do that? I, I didn't do anything. These were, these were out of my control. This is out of my circumstance. Pastor said, man, if you go through a divorce, you'll never preach again. You'll never serve God again. I didn't know what to do. You know, I was broken. It seemed like when you're going through these situations, there's nobody around. Nobody really cares for you. Nobody, nobody can comfort you in these times. And I laid on that floor and I started to get back up and to go. And I said, you know what? No matter what, I'm going to keep serving the Lord. I don't care what comes. I'm going to keep serving the Lord. Whatever God has for me, that's what we'll do. I began to work harder and harder and harder. And I tried to win her love back. I finally did. She came home with the baby. And she came home. Only to find out she had been with another man. Only to find out she would committed adultery. And she broke that sacred trust within the relationship. I said, you know what? I've forgiven a lot already. I said, God, help me do this. Help me forgive her of this sin and this fornication and this adultery in her, her life. Brought her back into the home. Less than two years later, I was at work. Little did I know... I was at work at 6 a.m. in the morning. She got up and cooked me breakfast. That should have been my first sign. <laughs> she only, not only did that, she brought me lunch. Never done that. Seven years of marriage. Little did I know that her mom and dad were right around the corner. When I pulled out, they pulled in. Once again, everything gone. That night, she joined a different church. The next day, she was with that guy. They thought it evil against me. They thought it evil against me. And not only did they start to try to destroy a marriage, but then they started trying to tell other preachers and other pastors not to call me, and not to have me, and to, to not just to shun me. A lot of them did. And they thought it evil against me. Many, I call many pastors for counsel, good friends of mine. They said, well, you might as well just hang it up. Go get a secular job. Go find something else to do. Divorce was final. Just, just quit serving the Lord. Just quit. You know what I wanted to do? Quit. <laughs> To be honest with you, I begin, I begin to become bitter in my life. 
I packed her up and went home to Missouri. I went home to Missouri, and there at Briggs Holler, where mom and dad lived, I, I, I was tore up, folks. I was a mess. I, I didn't want to preach again. And honestly, I didn't for several months. And then at Reedville Baptist Church, I began to preach a little bit. And then a uh, church down the road in Bourbon, Missouri, uh, my old youth pastor friend called me. He says, you know what? I'm fixing to, to leave. And he said, we, they need a new youth pastor. Would you, would you pray about coming and being the youth pastor there? And I did. And I prayed. And you know what? God just moved on my heart to go and to do that. And I went. And it was a struggle. I mean, I was on the struggle bus. Anyone ever been on that bus? I owned the title to that thing, right? Amen. <laughs> and uh, met Miss Danielle back there. She had been through a similar experience. I'll let her tell you that story. But she had been through a similar experience. And we ended up falling in love and getting married. And we had similar stories. And you know what? There's a lot of people today that just look at us crazy. They're like, you're divorced and serving the Lord? Let me tell you, I'm a divorced man, and I'm serving the Lord. Amen. And I tell you what, no matter what you're going through in your life, don't give up. Right. Don't, say, don't say that this is... Okay. I just want to talk to everybody. Uh, I want you to talk to the pastor and go back in the room and you can share with him and then he'll give you the okay or the, the, the nah. Um, so we, we was there and we were serving at uh, First Baptist Church in Bourbon, Missouri. And we, we, uh, God began to move on our heart to go on a mission trip. And God, you know, okay, we're going to take uh, kids. And the craziest thing you'll ever do is uh, get 24 kids and throw them into two 15-passenger buses and go across the country. I mean, it will change your life. <laughs> and uh, so we got out to uh, Navajo, the town of Navajo, which is just uh, north of Window Rock. And there's a little elementary school there. And in that elementary school, we did a vacation Bible school. And 12 young people come to know Christ as their personal Savior. And as we began to take those kids, I'll never forget this guy named Timothy. Uh, Timothy was 40 years old, but he had the mentality of a 7- or 8-year-old boy. And, and Timothy, he was there every day. Made a profession of faith, got saved, trusted Christ as his personal Savior. Amazing. But Timothy could hardly walk. And, and so he would drag himself up into the van. Oh, man. And I got to lead that man to the Lord. And these young kids, they began to come. And we was out there the last day. And me and my wife had taken them all down to the, uh, their places. And, you know, when we'd pick up the kids on the, van, uh, the 15 passenger bus, we'd probably put, I don't know, 30 in there, something like that. And, you know, the bus going down the road would, would do this number as you're going down the road. And then we began to drop them off. And we got down there to the last little bit. And I looked at my wife, and she's already in tears. And we just pulled over right on the side of the road there. And we began to pray and to cry. Just right there, I said, God, these young people need someone to tell them about Christ. And nobody's here. They, they begged us to stay. And I'm like, we're, we're Americans. We got calendars. We got to go. You know, we got plans. And you know what? That was year one of mission trips. Year two, we came to this area, Cortez, uh, and, and we did a, uh, a Bible club down at Sheep Springs. And um, we, we did that and more kids got saved and lives got changed. Year three, we came out here doing the same thing. And that's when God turned our burden into a calling. And we've been here, May will be 10 years See, when others meant things for evil, when the devil meant things for evil, and you know, I, I'm not a counter. I, I don't count souls being saved, but I know, I know that it's north of 300 souls that's been saved yeah. through what God has done. Not me, but through what God has done through us. God has saved much souls alive. When others counted it as evil, God meant it for good. Amen? Yeah. And see, the things that's befell us in our life, I count as now a blessing 
that God has took and turned that around. Good. Last thing I want to share with you just for a few minutes this morning, and I don't even know what time it is, 12.09. <laughs> I, do, I guarantee you, you will beat the seven day Adventist to the, the sword. Some of you will get that tomorrow. Okay. <clears throat> you guys remember the story of the, the Pharisees dragging this harlot before Christ? And they're, they got stones in their hand. And they're, ready to, they're, they're just waiting on the word from, uh, from, uh, from Jesus to stone her. They're, they're ready to kill her. And, and they said, this, this woman's been caught in adultery. And he says this statement. He says, you, without the, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. Right. And you know, they, they just drop those stones and walk away. Man, wouldn't you like to have been there? Right. But see, they thought it evil. They thought it evil against her. And their ultimate thing is to trap him. But they thought it evil. And then you go over into um, the, the book of Acts. And you find uh, there, you find Stephen. You find Stephen there. And they brought Stephen out. And they're going to stone him to death. And there is a man standing over the corner. And those that are stoning Stephen as he's standing there looking at the Son of God, standing on the right hand of God, they're thinking evil about uh, Stephen. You know, and, and they're stoning him. But something happened in Paul's life that day. And the thing that they thought evil, God used it for good. God pricked Paul's heart. And then Paul went around the whole country preaching the gospel message. Thousands of people got saved. They even went into a new continent. And people got started getting saved. I mean, he's the father of missions as we know it today. When they thought it evil, God counted it for good. I think about when the Son of God went over to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's there. Praying in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples sleeping. Some of you are probably asleep right now. <laughs> but they're sleeping. And Jesus, as he's there praying, great turmoil in his mind, praying, and great sweat drops of blood coming out of his head. I've been over there at Gethsemane, you can see all over the place for miles. I imagine as he's there praying. He looks across and he sees torches from Caiaphas' house. You know, he's all God. He knows who they are. He knows Judas is with them. And they're thinking evil in their mind. And they're, we're going to go arrest him. We're going to go get him. We're going after him. And as they go across that valley there and they make their way up through those thousand year old olive trees and they're making through the Garden of Gethsemane and they're thinking evil in their mind, they arrest the very Son of God. But God. Right. And then as they brought him back down through that valley and they go up those great rock stones to Caiaphas' house and there they put the Son of God down in this round three foot diameter hole into the basement into the cell they thought it evil against him but God That's right. then they would draw him out and they would send him over to uh, Pilate's house and there he would go through the scourging and there they would mock him and, and they would beat him and they would pluck his beard out and then they would take and they would stretch him between two poles and they would lay upon him the cat of nine tails some 39 times and they would rip the entrails very much right out of his body and they would make fun of him they thought it evil but God then they would take and they would put upon him that wooden cross. And he would go down that cobblestone street known as the Via Della Rosa. 
in that back of that wooden cross on that open wound of the cat and nine tails each time it would go across those cobblestones would dig into his back and they would mock him on the side of the streets the very people who cheered him coming in on Palm Sunday would now be mocking and spitting and cussing at the very Son of God and they thought it evil but God then they would take him up to the place of the skull. And there they would plant that tree. And there they put a, a reed in his hand. A robe on him. And there they would begin to mock him and make fun of him. And they thought it evil against him. And there that day upon that cross, God Almighty, as Jesus was taking upon him the sins of the world. My sins, by the way. Right. And the very God of creation would turn his back upon him. That's right. And the sun would refuse to shine. And they thought it evil against him. But God. And there they would, they would run the spear up into him and the water and the blood would pour out. And they thought it evil against him. But God. Then they would take down the lifeless body and they would take and they would lay it in a tomb, a borrowed tomb. And the very foundations of hell and the demons and the powers that be begin to celebrate because they thought it evil against God that they had won the victory. But God, day one, they would be excited and partying it up day two. They were excited they won the battle. Day three. Wait. But God. They would rush to the tomb. And all the evil thoughts and the intents. Oh. Oh. But God had a different plan. The very Son of God was rose again. Woo! He was gone. And that's what our uh, Christianity is about, is the risen Savior. Amen. Those that thought it evil against God or against Jesus, God had a different plan for all that right. evil. Amen. You see, the worst day in history is when mankind would commit deicide against God Almighty. It is the very worst day in history. But see, but God... Had a different plan. That's right. yeah. And the very best day in history is the very same day. Amen. When God Almighty would lay down His life right. for all of human uh, mankind's sin. Yeah. Wow! Amen. Are you allowing God to work in your but God experience? Hey, I don't know where you're at this morning. We're going to have an invitation here in a minute. I tell you what, wherever you're at, whether it's in your pew, whether it's up here, why don't you allow God to work in your but God experience? Yeah. Hey, maybe you've never been saved. Maybe you can't lay your hand upon your heart this morning and have a surety of where you're going to spend eternity in heaven. Huh? Maybe you don't know. I tell you what, the Bible... It can show you exactly where you can spend eternity. Huh? Amen? And there's a pastor here that would love to share that with you, or another brother, or another sister that would love to share that with you. Why don't you let your but God experience start this morning? Huh? Amen? And then there's all these other things that mankind says that you can't do this and serve God. Let me tell you, God's got another thing coming for you. Amen? But you've got to let Him release you to do it. Amen? Yes. You need to allow Him to work in your but God experience. Don't let anyone tell you. If you're still here and there's a breath in you, God's got a plan for you. Right. Amen? Yes. God's got a purpose for you. He wants you to serve Him. Quit letting people tell you you can't. Quit letting others tell you. Don't read those, those silly books and don't listen to, 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 to Oprah and all those other ones. Amen? Yes. Listen to God. God's got something for you. Amen? Let me go and serve God.